Today we're happy, very happy to have Andrew Trask. He's a brilliant writer, researcher, tweeter, that's a word, in the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence. He is the author of Grok and Deep Learning, the book that I highly recommended in the uh, lecture on Monday. He's the leader and creator of Open Mind, which is an open source community that strives to make our algorithms, our data, and our world in general more privacy preserving. He is coming to us by way of Oxford, but without that rich, complex, beautiful, sophisticated British <laughs> accent, unfortunately. He is one of the best educators and truly one of the nicest people I know, so please give him a warm welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks, that was a very uh, generous introduction. So uh, yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, privacy-preserving AI. This talk's gonna kinda come in, in two parts. So the first is going to be looking at sort of privacy tools uh, from the context of a data scientist or a researcher, like how their actual UX might change. Um, because I think that's sort of the best way to communicate uh, some of the new technologies that are, that are coming about in that context. Uh, and then we're gonna zoom out and look at um, under the assumption that these kinds of technologies become mature, um, what is that going to do to kind of society? Like what, what sort of consequences or, or side effects could, could these kinds of tools have, um, um, both positive and negative? So first, let's ask the question, um, is it possible to answer questions using data that we cannot see? This is going to be the key question that we look at today. Um, and uh, let's, let's start with an example. So first, if we wanted to answer the question, what do tumors look like in humans? Um, well. This is a pretty complex question. You know, tumors are pretty complicated things. So we might train an AI classifier. And if we wanted to, to do that, uh, we would first need to download a data set of tumor-related images, right? So we'd be able to statistically study these and be able to recognize what tumors look like in, in humans. But this kind of data is not very easy to come by, right? So it's, it's very rarely that it's collected. It's kind of difficult to move around. It's highly regulated. Um, and so we're probably going to have to buy it from a relatively small number of sources that are, are able to actually collect and manage this kind of information. Um, the scarcity and, and sort of constraints uh, around this is likely to make this a relatively expensive purchase. And if it's going to be an expensive purchase for us to answer this question, well, then we're going to have to find someone to sort of finance our project. And if we need someone to finance our project, we have to, we have to come up with a way of how we're going to pay them back. Um, if we're going to create a business plan, then we have to find a business partner. If we're going to find a business partner, we have to span all our classmates in LinkedIn, you know, looking for someone to start a business with us, right? And all this is because we wanted to answer the question, what do tumors look like? in humans. But what if we wanted to answer a different question? What if we wanted to answer the question, what do handwritten digits look like? Well, this would be a totally different story, right? We'd download a data set. We'd download a state-of-the-art training script from GitHub. We'd run it, and a few minutes later, we'd have you know, a, a ability to classify handwritten digits with potentially superhuman ability, right, if, if such a thing exists. And why is this so different between these two questions? The reason is that getting access to private data, data about people, is really, really hard. And as a result, we spend most of our time working on problems and tasks like this. So ImageNet, MNIST, CIFAR 10. Anybody who's trained a classifier on MNIST before? Raise your hand. I expect pretty much everybody. Um, instead of working on problems like this, does anyone um, train a classifier to predict dementia? Diabetes? Alzheimer's? I don't know if I can keep going. Depression? Anxiety? No one. So, you know, why is it that we spend all our time on tasks like this when, when these tasks, these represent you know, our, our friends and loved ones and, and problems in, in society that, that really, really matter. Not to say that there aren't people working on this. Uh, it's absolutely, uh, you know, there are, there are whole fields dedicated to it, but, but sort of the machine learning community at large, these tasks are pretty inaccessible. In fact, um, in order to work on one of these, just getting access to the data, you'd have to dedicate like a portion of your life just to getting access to it, whether it's you know, doing a startup or, or you know, joining a hospital or, or, or what have you, whereas for other kinds of data sets, they're just simply readily accessible. This brings us back to our question. Is it possible to answer questions using data that we cannot see? So in this talk, we're gonna walk through a few different techniques. Um, and if the answer to this question is yes, the combination of these techniques we try to make it so that we can actually pip install access to data sets like these in the same way that we pip install access to our other deep learning tools. 
Right? And the, the idea here is to lower the barrier to entry to increase the accessibility to some of the most important problems that, that we would like to, to address. So um, as, as Lex mentioned, uh, I lead a community called OpenMind, which is an open source community of a little over 6,000 people um, who are focused on sort of lowering the barrier to entry to privacy preserving AI and machine learning. Uh, and specifically, one of the tools they're working on we're talking about today is called PySift. PySift um, extends the major deep learning frameworks with the ability to do privacy preserving machine learning. So specifically today, we're gonna be looking at the extensions into PyTorch. So PyTorch, people are generally familiar with PyTorch. Yeah, quite a few users. Um, and, um, it's my hope that by walking through a few of these tools, it'll become sort of clear um, how we can start to be able to do sort of data science, the, the act of sort of answering questions using data, using data that we don't actually have direct access to, right? And then uh, in the second half of the talk, we're gonna generalize this to answering questions uh, even if you're not, not necessarily a data scientist. So first, first tool is remote execution, okay? So let's just uh, walk, walk me through this. So, um, um, we're gonna jump into code for a minute, but hopefully this is sort of line by line and relatively simple. And even if you aren't familiar with PyTorch, I think it's, it's relatively intuitive. We're looking at like lists of numbers and these kinds of things. So up at the top, we import uh, Torch as a deep learning framework. Um, Sift extends Torch with this thing called Torch Hook. All it's doing is just iterating through the library and basically monkey patching in lots of new functionality. Um, and most deep learning frameworks are built around one core primitive. And that core primitive is the tensor, right? So, you know, and for, for those of you who don't know what tensors are, just think of them as nested list of numbers for now, and, and that'll be good enough for this, this talk. Um, but for us, we introduce a second core primitive, which is the worker, right? And a worker is a location upon, within which computation is going to be occurring, right? So in this case, we have a, a virtualized worker that is, that is uh, pointing to, say, a, a hospital data center. Right? And the assumption that we have is that this worker will allow us to run computation inside of the data center without us actually um, having direct access to that worker itself. Right? It gives us a, a limited sort of whitelisted uh, set of methods that we can use um, on, this, on this remote machine. So just to give you an example, so um, there's that core primitive we talked about a minute ago. We have the, the torch tensor, so one, one, three, four, five. Um, and the first method that we added is called just dot send, right? And this does exactly what you might expect. Takes the tensor, serializes it, sends it into the hospital data center, and returns back to me a pointer. Now this pointer is really, really special. And for those of you who are actually familiar with deep learning frameworks, I hope that this will, this will really resonate with you. Because it has the full PyTorch API as a part of it, but whenever you execute something using this pointer, instead of it running locally, even though it looks like and feels like it's running locally, it actually executes on the remote machine and returns back to you another pointer to the result, right? The idea here being that I can now coordinate remote executions, remote computations without, um, without necessarily having to have direct access to, to the machine. And of course I can get a, a dot .get request and we'll see um, um, that this is actually really, really important. So getting permissions around when you can do dot .get requests and actually re ask for data from a remote machine back to you. So just uh, remember that one. Cool, so this is just, this is where we start. So in the kind of like the Pareto principle, you know, 80% for, for 20%, this is like the, the, the first big cut, right? So pros, data remains on a remote machine. We can now, in theory, do data science on a machine that we don't have access to, that we don't own, right? But the problem is, um, the first, first column we want to address is how can we actually do good data science without physically seeing the data, right? So it's all well and good to say, oh, I'm gonna train a deep learning classifier, but, but the, the process of answering questions is inherently iterative, right? It's inherently sort of, sort of give and take. And I, I learn a little bit and I ask a little bit, I learn a little bit and I ask a little bit, right? This brings me to the second tool. So search and example data. Again, we're, we're starting really simple. It, it will get more, more complex here in a minute. Um, so in this case, let's say we have what's called a grid. So PyGrid, um, if PySift is a library, PyGrid is sort of the platform version. So it's, it's sort of, uh, again, this is all open source Apache 2 stuff. This is, um, we have uh, what's called a grid client. So this, is, this could be an interface to um, a large number of data sets inside of a big hospital, right? Um, and so let's say I wanted to train a classifier to do something with diabetes, right? So to, mean to predict diabetes or predict a certain kind of diabetes or a certain attribute of diabetes, right? Um, I should be able to perform remote search. Um, I get back pointers to throw the remote information. 
I can get back sort of detailed descriptions of, of what the information is without me actually looking at it, right? So how it was collected, what the rows and columns are, um, what the types uh, of different information is, what, what the various ranges of the values can take on, things that allow me to do sort of remote normalization, these kinds of things. And then in some cases, um, even look at samples of this data. So this, these samples could be sort of uh, human curated, they could be generated from a, a GAN, they could be, um, um, they could be uh, actually you know, short snippets from the actual data set. You know, maybe it's okay to release small amounts but not large amounts. Um, and, and the reason that I highlight this, this isn't like crazy complex stuff. So um, previous, prior to going back to school, I used to work for a company called Digital Reasoning. Um, we did sort of on-prem um, uh, data science, right? So we, we did um, uh, delivered sort of AI services uh, to, to corporations behind the firewall. So we did you know, classified information. Um, we worked with investment banks, you know, helping prevent insider trading. Um, and, and doing data science on data that like your home team, you know, back in, in Nashville, in our case, is not able to see is really, really challenging. Um, but there are some things that, that can give you sort of um, the, the, the first big jump before you jump into kind of the more complex tools to handle um, some of the more, more challenging use cases. Cool, so, so basic remote execution, so remote PC recalls, um, um, basic uh, sort of private search, um, and the ability to kind of look at sample data gives us enough sort of general context to be able to, to start doing sort of things like feature engineering and evaluating quality, okay? So now the data remains in the remote machine, we can do some basic feature engineering, and here's where things get a little more complicated, okay? So if you remember, um, in the very first slide where I show you some code at the bottom, I called .get on a tensor, right? And what that did was it took, took the pointer to some remote information and said, hey, send that information to me. That is an incredibly important bottleneck, right? And unfortunately, despite the fact that I'm doing all my remote execution, if that's just naively implemented, well, I can just steal all the data that I want to, right? I just call .get on whatever pointers I want, and, I can, and there's sort of no additional added real security. So what are we gonna do about this? This brings us to tool number three called differential privacy. Differential privacy? You want to come across? A little higher? Okay, cool, awesome, good. So I'm gonna do a quick high level overview of the intuition of differential privacy, and then we're gonna jump into how it could, can, can and is being is looking sort of in the code, um, and I'll give you resources for kind of a deeper dive in differential privacy um, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, should you be interested. So differential privacy, loosely stated, um, is a field that allows you to do statistical analysis um, without compromising the privacy of the, of the data set, right? So it, um, more specifically, it allows you to query a database, right, while making certain guarantees about the privacy of the, of the records contained within the database. So let me show you what I mean. Let's say we have a, a, an example database, and so this is kind of the canonical DB if you look in the literature for differential privacy. Um, it'll have sort of one row for person, one, one row per person, and one column of zeros and ones, which corresponds to true and false. We don't actually really care what those zeros and ones are indicating. You know, it could be um, presence of a disease, could be male, female, could be, it's just some, some sensitive attribute, something that's, that's worth protecting, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to, our goal is to ensure statistical analysis doesn't compromise privacy. What we're going to do is query this database, right? So we're gonna run some function over the entire database, and we're going to look at the result, and then we're gonna ask a very important question. We're going to ask, if I were to remove someone from this database, say, John, would the output of my function change? Okay? And if the answer to that is no, then intuitively we can, we, can, we can say that, well, this, this output is not conditioned on John's private information. Now, if we could say that about everyone in the data, in the data database, right, well then, okay, we, it would be a perfectly privacy-preserving query, right? But it might not be that useful. But this intuitive definition, I think, is, is quite powerful, right? The notion of how can we construct queries that are invariant to removing someone or replacing them with someone else, okay? And the notion of the maximum amount that the output of a function can change as a result of removing or replacing one of the individuals is known as the sensitivity. Okay, so important. So if you're reading literature and you find come across sensitivity, that's what they're talking about. So, what do we do when we have a really sensitive function? Um, we're going to take a, a bit of a, a sidestep for a minute. Um, I have a, a sister, a uh, twin sister, who's uh, finishing a PhD in political science. And political science, uh, often they need to answer questions about very taboo behavior. Okay, something that people are likely to lie about. So let's say I wanted to survey everyone in this room, and I wanted to answer the question, um, uh, 
uh, what percentage of you are, you know, secretly serial killers, right? And not because, like, it, yeah, not because I think any one, one of you are, but because I genuinely want to understand this trend, right? I'm not trying to arrest people. I'm not trying to sort of, sort of, um, uh, be an instrument of the criminal justice system. I'm trying to be you know, a sociologist or political scientist and understand this, this actual trend. The problem is, if I sit down with each one of you in, in, a, in a private room and I say, I promise, I promise, I promise, I won't tell anybody, right? I'm still gonna get a skewed distribution, right? There can be some people who are just gonna be like, why would I risk um, telling you this, this private information? And so what, what sociologists can do is this, this technique called randomized response, where, um, oh, I should've brought a coin. Um, you take a coin and um, you give it to each person before you survey them, right? and you ask them to flip it twice somewhere that you cannot see. So I would ask each one of you to flip a coin twice somewhere that I cannot see. And then I would instruct you to, um, if the first coin flip is a heads, answer honestly. But if the first coin flip is a tails, answer yes or no based on the second coin flip. Okay, so roughly half the time, you'll be honest, and the other half of the time, You'll be, a, you'll be giving me a perfect 50-50 coin flip. And the cool thing is that what this is actually doing is taking whatever the true mean of the distribution is and averaging it with a 50-50 coin flip, right? So if, say, 55% um, of you uh, answered yes, that, that you are a, a serial killer, um, then I know that the true center of the distribution is actually 60%, because it was 60% averaged with a 50-50 coin flip. Does that make sense? However, despite the fact that I can recover the center of the distribution, right, given enough samples, um, each individual person has plausible deniability. If you said yes, it could have been because you actually are, or it could have been because you just happened to flip a certain sequence of coin flips, okay? Now this concept of adding noise to data to give plausible deniability is sort of the secret weapon of differential privacy. Right? And, and the field itself is a, a, a set of mathematical proofs for trying to do this as efficiently as possible, to give sort of the smallest amount of noise, to get the most accurate results, right, um, with the best possible privacy protections, right? There is a meaningful um, sort of base trade-off that you, 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 you know, um, there's, kind of, there's kind of a Pareto trade-off, right, and, and we're trying to, to push that, push that trade-off down. Um, um, but so the, 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 the field of research that is differential privacy um, is looking at how to add noise to data and, and resulting queries to give plausible deniability to the, to the, the members of a, of a database or a training data set. Does that make sense? Now, um, a, a few um, terms that you should be familiar with. So there's local and there's global differential privacy. So local differential privacy adds noise to data before it's sent to the statistician. So in this case, the one with the coin flip, this was local differential privacy. It affords you the best am amount of protection because you never actually reveal sort of in the clear your information to, so to someone, right? And then there's global differential privacy, which says, okay, we're gonna put everything in the database, perform a query, and then before the output of the query gets published, we're gonna add a little bit of noise to the output of the query, okay? This tends to have a much better privacy trade-off, but you have to trust the database owner to not compromise the results. And we'll see there's some other things we can do there. Um, but with me so far, this is a good, good point for questions, if you had any questions. Got it, so the question is, um, is this verifiable? Um, any of this, this process of differential privacy verifiable? Um, so that, that is a fantastic question, um, and one that actually absolutely comes up in practice. Um, um, so first, local differential privacy, the nice thing is everyone's doing it for themselves, right? So in that sense, if you're flipping your own coins and answering your own questions, um, it, that's, that's your verification, right? You're, you're kind of trusting yourself. For global differential privacy, um, stay tuned for the next tool, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. All right, so what does this look like in code? So first, we have a pointer to a remote private data set. We call .git. Whoa, we get big fat error, right? You just asked to sort of see the raw value of some private data point, which you cannot do, right? Instead, pass in .git epsilon to add the appropriate amount of noise. So one thing I haven't mentioned yet, um, uh, differential privacy, so I mentioned sensitivity, right? So sensitivity was um, uh, relating to the, the type of query, the type of function that we wanted to do, and it's invariance to um, removing or replacing individual entries in the, in, in the database. Um, so epsilon is a measure of what we call our privacy budget, right? And what our privacy budget is, is saying, okay, what, what's, the, what's the amount of, of statistical uniqueness that I'm going to sort of limit 
uh, what's the upper bound for the amount of statistical uniqueness that I'm going to allow to come out of this, out of this database? Um, and actually, I'm going to take one more side, side track here um, because I think it's really worth mentioning. Um, data anonymization. Anyone familiar with data anonymization come across this term before? Taking a document, like redacting the, the social security numbers and like all this kind of stuff. By and large, it does not work. If you don't remember anything else from this talk, it is very dangerous to do just data set anonymization. Okay? And differential privacy, in, in some respects, is, is, is the formal version of data anonymization, where instead of, instead of just saying, okay, I'm just going to redact out these pieces and, and I'll be fine, um, this is saying, okay, um, that we, we can do a lot better. So, for example, a Netflix prize, Netflix machine learning prize, if you remember this, a big million dollar prize, maybe some people in here competed in it. So, in this prize, right, um, Netflix published an anonymized data set, right, and that was... Um, movies and users, right? And they took all the movies and replaced them with numbers. And they took all the users and replaced them with numbers. And then we just had sparsely populated movie ratings in this matrix, right? Seemingly anonymous, right? There's no names of any kind. Um, but the problem is, is that each row is statistically unique. Meaning it kind of is its own fingerprint. And so two months after the data set was published, some researchers at uh, UT Austin, um, I, think it was, I think it was UT Austin, um, were able to go and scrape IMDB and basically create the same matrix in IMDB and then just compare the two. And it turns out people that were into movie rating were into movie rating and, and, and were watching movies at, at similar times, at similar, similar patterns, at similar tastes, right? And they were able to de-anonymize this first data set with a high degree of accuracy. Uh, it happened again with, there's a, there's a famous case of like uh, medical records for like, uh, I think a, I think been a Massachusetts senator, I think, it was someone in the Northeast, um, uh, be, being de-anonymized uh, through very similar techniques. So some, one person goes and buys a anonymized medical data set over here that has, you know, birth date and zip code, and this one does zip code and, and gender, and this one does zip code, gender, and whether or not you have cancer, right? And, and when you get all these together, um, you, you can start to sort of, use the uniqueness in each one to, to relink it all back together. I mean, I, um, it, this is so doable to the, to the extreme that I, I unfortunately know of companies whose business model is to buy anonymized data sets, de-anonymize them, and sell market intelligence to insurance companies. Ooh, right? But it can be done, okay? And, and the reason that it can be done is that just because the data set that you are publishing, the one that you are physically looking at, doesn't seem like it has, you know, social security numbers and stuff in it, does not mean that there's enough unique statistical signal for it to be linked to something else. And so when I say maximum amount of epsilon, epsilon is an upper bound on, on the, the statistical uniqueness that you're publishing in a data set, right? And so what, what this tool represents is saying, okay, apply however much noise you need to, given whatever computational graph led back to private data for this tensor, right? To ensure that you know, to, to, to put an upper bound on the, on the potential for linkage attacks, right? Now, if you said epsilon zero, okay, then that's, that's saying um, effectively, like, uh, um, there's the, I'm only going to allow out patterns that have occurred at least twice, right? Okay, so meaning, meaning two different people uh, had this pattern and thus it's not unique to either one. Yes. So what happens if you perform the query twice? So the random noise would be re-randomized and, and, and sent again, and you're absolutely, absolutely correct. So this epsilon, this is how much I'm spending with this query. So if I ran this three times, I would spend epsilon of 0.3. Does that make sense? So this is, this is a 0.1 query. If I did this multiple times, the epsilons would sum. And so for any given data science project, right, I should, I, I, what we're, we're advocating is that you're given an epsilon budget that you're not allowed to exceed, right, no matter how many queries that you, you participate. Now, there's, there's another sort of subfield of differential privacy that's looking at um, sort of single query approaches. Um, which is all around synthetic data sets. So how can I perform sort of one query against a whole data set and create a synthetic data set that has um, certain invariances that are desirable, right? So I can do good statistics on it, um, but then I can query this as many times as I want. Because basically, um, you can't, um, uh, yeah, anyway, but we, we, we don't have to get into that now. Does that answer your question? Cool, awesome. So now you might think, okay, this is like a lossless cause. Like how can we be answering questions while protecting, while, while keeping statistical signal gone? But like it's, it's the difference between, um, it's the difference between if I have a data set and I want to know what causes cancer, right? I could query a data set and learn that smoking causes cancer without learning that individuals are, are or are not smokers. Does that make sense? Right? 
And the reason for that is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm specifically looking for patterns that are occurring multiple times across different people. And this actually happens to really um, closely mirror the type of generalization that we want in machine learning statistics anyways. Does that make sense? Like, as machine learning practitioners, we're actually not really interested in the one-offs, right? I mean, sometimes our models memorize things. This, this happens, right? But we're actually more interested in the things that are the things that are not specific to you. I want I want the things that are going to work. You know, the, the heart treatments they're going to work for everyone in this room. Not just I mean, I, you know, obviously if you need a heart treatment, I'd be happy. That'd be cool for you to have one. But like, what we're chiefly interested in are, are the things that generalize, right? Which which is why this is realistic, um, um, and why with with continued effort on both tooling and and the theory side, um, we can we can have a much better uh, reality than today. Cool. So um, pros, just to review. So first, uh, remote execution allows us allows data to remain on the remote machine. Search and sampling, we can feature engineer using toy data. Differential privacy, we can have a formal rigorous privacy budgeting mechanism, right? Yeah, shoot. How is the privacy budget set? Is it defined by the user or is it defined by the data set owner or, or someone else? Um, this is a really, really interesting question, actually. Um, so first, it's definitely not set by the data scientist um, because that would be a bit of a conflict of interest. Um, and at at first, you might say it should be the data owner, okay? So the hospital, right? That's trying to cover their butt, right? And make sure that their assets are protected, both legally and and commercially, right? So they're they're trying to make make money off this. So there's there's um, um, there's sort of proper incentives there. But the interesting thing, and this gets back to your question, is what happens if I have say a radiology scan in two different hospitals, right? And they both spend one epsilon worth of, of, of my privacy in each of these hospitals, right? That means that actually two epsilon of my private information is out there, right? And it just means that one person has to be clever enough to go to both places to get the join. This is actually the exact same mechanism we were talking about a second ago when someone went from Netflix to IMDb, right? And so the, the true answer of who should be setting epsilon budgets Although um, logistically, this is going to be challenging. We're talking about a little bit of this in, in, in part two of the talk, but I'm going a little bit slow. Um, but okay, um, is um, it should be us? It should be people. In the, it should be people uh, around their own information. Right? You should be setting your personal epsilon budget. Does that makes sense. That's an aspirational goal. Um, we've got a long way before we can get to that level of of infrastructure around these kinds of things. Um, and we can talk about that, and we can definitely talk about more of that in the kind of question and answer session as well. But I think, in, in theory, in theory, that's what, what we would want. Okay, um, the two cons that we still, the two weaknesses of this approach that we still lack are, someone asked this question, I think it was you? Yeah, yeah, you asked the question. Um, so first, the data is safe, but the model's put at risk. Uh, and what if we need to do a join? Actually, actually, yours is the third one, which I should totally add to the slide. Um, so, so first, um, if I'm sending my, my computations, my model into the hospital to learn how to be a better cancer classifier, right, my model's put at risk. It's kind of a bummer if like, you know, this is a $10 million healthcare model, I'm just sending it to a thousand different hospitals to get learn, to, to learn, so that's potentially risky. Second, um, what if I need to do a join computation across multiple different data owners who don't trust each other, right? Who sends whose data to whom, right? And thirdly, um, as you pointed out, how do I trust that these computations are actually happening the way that I am telling the remote machine that they should happen? This brings me to my absolute favorite tool. Secure multi-party computation, come across this before? Raise them high. Okay, cool, a little bit above average. Most machine learning people have not heard about this yet, and I absolutely, is, this is the coolest, this is the coolest thing I've learned about since learning about like AI and machine learning. This is a, this is a really, really cool technique. Um, encrypted computation, how about homomorphic encryption? You come across homomorphic encryption? Okay, a few more, yeah. This is related to that. Um, so first, the kind of textbook definition is, is like this. So if you went on Wikipedia, you'd see uh, Security PC allows multiple people to combine their private inputs to compute a function without revealing their inputs to each other, okay? Um, but in the context of machine learning, the implication of this is multiple different individuals can share ownership of a number, okay? Share ownership of a number. I'll show you what I mean. So let's say I have the number five, my happy smiling face, and I split this into two shares, a two and a three, okay? I've got two friends, Marianne and Bobby, and I give them these shares. They are now the shareholders 
of this number. Okay? And now I'm going to go away, and this number is shared between them. Okay? And this, this gives us several desirable properties. First, it's encrypted from the standpoint that neither Bob nor Marianne can tell what number is encrypted between them by looking at their own share by itself. Now, I've, um, um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, kind of cryptographic math, um, I'm hand waving over this a little bit. This would typically be, so in, in, or decryption would be adding the shares together modulus uh, a large prime. Um, so these would typically look like sort of large pseudo random numbers, right? But for the sake of making it sort of intuitive, I've picked pseudo random numbers that are convenient to the eyes. Um, so first, these two values are encrypted. And second, we get shared governance, meaning that we cannot decrypt these numbers or do anything with these numbers unless all of the shareholders agree. Okay? But the truly extraordinary part is that while this number is encrypted between these individuals, we can actually perform computation. Right? So in this case, let's say we wanted to multiply these shares times, or the, the encrypted number times two. Each person can multiply their share times two, and now they have an encrypted number 10. Right? And there's a whole variety of protocols allowing you to do different functions, um, uh, such as the functions needed for machine learning, um, while numbers are in this encrypted state. Okay? Um, and I'll, I'll give some more resources for you, for you if you're interested in kind of learning more about this at the end as well. And now the big tie-in. Models and data sets are just large collections of numbers which we can individually encrypt, which we can individually uh, share governance over. Um, now, specifically to reference your question, there's two configurations of, of SecureMPC, active and passive security. In the active security model, you can tell if anyone does computation that you did not sort of independently authorize, which is great. So what does this look like in practice when you go back to the code? So in this case, we don't need just one worker. It's not just one hospital, because we're looking to have shared governance, shared ownership amongst multiple different individuals. So let's say we have Bob, Alice, and Teo, and a crypto provider, which we won't go into now. Um, and I can take a tensor, and instead of calling .send and sending that tensor to someone else, now I call .share, and that splits each value into multiple different shares and distributes those amongst the shareholders, right? So in this case, Bob, Alice, and Teo. However, in the frameworks that we're working on, you still get kind of the same PyTorch-like interface, and all the cryptographic protocol happens under the hood. And the idea here is to make it so that we can sort of do encrypted machine learning without you necessarily having to be a cryptographer, right? And vice versa, cryptographers can imp improve the algorithms and machine learning people can automatically inherit them, right? So kind of classic sort of open source machine uh, learning library making complex intelligence more accessible to people, uh, if that makes sense. And what we can do on tensors, we can also do on models. So we can do encrypted training uh, and encrypted prediction. And we're going to get into uh, what kind of awesome use cases this opens up in a bit. And this is a nice set of features, right? In my opinion, this is, this is sort of the, the MVP of doing privacy-preserving data science, right? The idea being that I can have remote access to a remote data set. I can learn high-level latent patterns like, like, you know, what causes cancer without learning whether individuals have cancer. I can pull back just, just that sort of high-level information with formal mathematical guarantees over, over um, you know, what's, you know, sort of the filter that's, that's coming back through here, right? And I can work with data sets from multiple different data owners while making sure that each, each individual data owners are, are protected. Now, what's the catch? Okay. So first um, is computational complexity. Right? So encrypted computation, secure MPC, um, this, this involves sending lots of information over, over the network. Uh, I think the, the state of the art for, for, train, or for uh, deep learning prediction um, is that this is a 13x slowdown over plain text, um, which is inconvenient, but not deadly. Right? But you, you do kind of have to understand that. That assumes like it's like two AWS machines sort of like talking to each other. You know, they're relatively fast. Um, but we also haven't had any like hardware optimization to the extent that, that you know, NVIDIA did a lot for deep learning. Like th there'll be you know, probably like some sort of Cisco player that's similar for, for doing kind of encrypted or, or secure PC based deep learning. Right? Um, let's see. So this brings us back to kind of the fundamental question. Is it possible to answer questions using data we cannot see? Um, the theory is absolutely there. Um, I, that's, that's something that, that I, I feel reasonably confident saying. Like, like the, 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 the sort of the theoretical frameworks that we have, and actually the other thing that's really worth mentioning here is that these come from totally different fields, which is why they kind of haven't been necessarily combined that much yet. I'll get, I'll get more into that in a second. Um, 
but it's it's my hope that that by sort of by considering what these tools can do, that'll open up your eyes to the potential that in general we can have this new ability to answer questions using information that we don't actually own ourselves. Um, because from a sociological standpoint, that's net new for like us as a species. If that makes sense. If ever previously we we, just, we had to have we had to have like a, a trusted third party who would then take all the information in themselves and and make some sort of neutral decision, right? Um, so we'll come to that in a second. Um, and so one of the big sort of long-term goals of our community is to make infrastructure for this secure enough and robust enough, and of course in like a free Apache 2 open source license kind of way, um, that you know information on the world's most important problems will be this accessible, right? And we can spend sort of less time working on um, tasks like that and more time working on tasks like this. So um, this is going to be kind of the, the breaking point between sort of part one and part two. Um, part two will be a bit shorter. Um, but if you're interested in, in sort of diving deeper on the technicals of this, um, here's a, like a six or seven hour course that I taught just on these concepts and on the tools. It's free uh, on Udacity. Feel free to check it out. Um, so the question was, um, uh, he's asking about how I, I specified that a model can be encrypted during training. Is that same as homomorphic encryption or that's that something else? So um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a big burst in literature around training on encrypted data, um, where you would homomorphically encrypt the data set, and it turned out that some of the statistical regularities of homomorphic encryption allowed you to actually train on that data set without, um, without decrypting it. Um, so this is similar to that, except um, the one downside to that is that in order to use that model in the future, you have to still be able to encrypt data with the same key, um, which often is, is, is sort of constraining in practice. And also, there's a pretty big hit to privacy because you're, you're training on data that inherently has a lot of noise added to it. What I'm advocating for here um, is instead we actually encrypt um, both the model and the data set uh, during training. But inside the encryption, inside the box, right, it's actually performing the same computations that it would be doing in plain text. So you don't get any degradation in accuracy, um, and you don't get tied to one particular public-private key pair. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, specifically, so the question was, can I comment on federated learning, specifically Google's implementation? Um, so I think Google's implementation is, is great. So um, and obviously, the, the fact that they've shown that this can be done, hundreds of millions of users, is incredibly powerful. I mean, uh, and, uh, even inventing the term um, uh, and creating momentum in that direction. Um, I think that there's um, one thing that is worth mentioning is that there are two forms of federated learning. Uh, one is sort of the one where your model is uh, federated learning. Sorry. Uh, ooh, got to talk about what that is. OK. Um, yes, I'll do that quickly. Um, so federated learning is. Um, basically the first thing I talked about, so remote execution. So if, if everyone has a smartphone, um, when you plug your phone in at night, if you've got you know, an Android or iOS, you plug your phone in at night and attach to Wi-Fi, you know when you text and it recommends the next word, um, next word prediction? Um, that model is trained using federated learning, um, meaning that it, it learns on your device to do that better, and then that model gets uploaded to the cloud, as opposed to uploading all of your tweets to the cloud and training one global model. Does that make sense? So, so you plug your phone at night, model comes down, trains locally, goes back up, it's federated, right? That's, that's, the, that's basically what federated learning is in a nutshell. And, and um, uh, it was pioneered uh, by the Quark team at, at Google, and, um, uh, and they're, they're, they do really fantastic work. They've, they've paid down a lot of the technical debt, a lot of the, 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 ri the risk, or technical risk around it, um, and they published really great papers outlining sort of how they do it, which is fantastic. Um, what I outlined here is actually a slightly different style of federated learning, because there, there's federated learning with like a fixed data set and a fixed model, um, and lots of users where the, the data is very um, ephemeral, like phones are constantly logging in and logging off. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're plugging your phone in at night and then you're taking it out, right? Um, um, this is sort of the, the, the one style of federated learning. It's, it's really useful for like product development. Right? So it's useful for like, if you want to do a smartphone app that has a piece of intelligence in it, but training that intelligence is going to be prohibitively difficult for you to get access to the data for, um, or you, you want to just have a value prop of protecting privacy, right? that's what federated learning, that style of federated learning is good for. What I've outlined here is a bit more exploratory federated learning, where it's saying, okay, instead of, instead of um, the model being hosted in the cloud and data owners showing up and making it a bit smarter every once in a while, now the data is going to be hosted at a variety of different private clouds. Right? And data scientists are going to show up and say, hmm, I want to do something with, di with diabetes today. Or, hmm, I want to do something with, with um, uh, studying dementia today. Something like that, right? This is much more difficult because the attack vectors for this are, are much larger. 
right? I'm trying to be able to answer arbitrary questions about arbitrary data sets um, in, in a protected environment, right? So I think, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my, my general thoughts on, on uh, does federated learning leak any information? So federated learning by itself is not a secure protocol, right? To the, to the, to the extent that, um, uh, and that's why sort of this ensemble of techniques that I've, so the question was, uh, does federated learning leak information? Um, so it is perfectly possible for a federated learning model to simply memorize a data set uh, and then spit that back out later. You have to combine it with something like differential privacy in order to be able to prevent that from happening. Does that make sense? Um, so just, just because the, the training's happening on my device does not mean it's not memorizing my data. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so now I want to zoom out and, and go a little less from the kind of the data science practitioner perspective. And now I take more the perspective of like a, an economist or political scientist or so, someone looking kind of globally at like, okay, if, if this becomes mature, what happens, right? And, and this is where it gets really exciting. Anyone entrepreneurial? Anyone? Everyone? I don't know. No one? <laughs> okay, cool. Well, this is, this, is the, this is the part for you. So... Um, the big difference is this ability to answer questions using data you can't see. Because as it turns out, most people spend a great deal of their life just answering questions, and a lot of it is involving sort of personal data. I mean, whether it's minute things like, you know, where's my water, where are my keys, or, you know, um, what movie should I watch tonight, or, or um, you know, uh, what kind of diet should I have to, to be able to sleep well. Right, I mean, a, a wide variety of different questions, right? And, and we're limited in our answering ability to the information that we have, right? So this ability to answer questions using data we don't have, sociologically, I think is quite, quite important. Um, and um, there's four different areas that I want to highlight as like big groups of use cases for this kind of technology um, to help kind of inspire you to see where this infrastructure can go. And actually, before I, before I jump into that, um, has anyone been to Edinburgh? Edinburgh, cool. Uh, just see, just tour like the castle and stuff like that. Um, so my wife and I, um, this is my wife, Amber. Um, we went to Edinburgh for the first time um, six months ago, September, September. Um, and uh, we did the underground, was it the, oh, we did a ghost tour. Yeah, 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 we did the ghost tour. And um, yeah, it was really cool. Um, <laughs> there was one thing that I took away from it. There was this point we were standing, um, we just walked out of the tunnels, and she was pointing up at some of the architecture. Um, and uh, then uh, she started talking about um, basically the cobblestone streets and why the cobblestone streets are there. Cobblestone streets, one of the main purposes of them was to sort of lift you out of the muck. And the reason there was muck was there is that they didn't have any in internal plumbing, and so the sewage was just poured out into the street, right? Because you live in a big city. Um, and this was the norm everywhere, right? And actually, I think she even sort of implied that like the invention or popularization of the umbrella had less to do with actual rain, a bit more to do with buckets of stuff coming down from on high, um, which is, uh, uh, it's a whole different world, like when you think about what that is. Um, but the, the reason that I bring this up um, is that, you know, however many hundred years ago, people were, were walking through, you know, like sludge, sewage was just everywhere, right? It was all over the place. And people were walking through it everywhere they go. And they were wondering why they got sick, right? And in many cases, and, and it, it wasn't because they wanted it to be that way. It was just because it was a natural consequence of the technology that they had at the time, right? It, this is not malice. This is not anyone being good or bad or, or evil or whatever. It's just, it's just the way things were. Um, and I think that there's a strong analogy to be made with, with kind of how our data is handled as a society at the moment, right? We've just sort of walked into a society, we've had new inventions come up and new things that are practical, new uses for it, and now everywhere we go, we're constantly spreading and spewing our data all over the place, right? I mean, every, every camera that sees me walking down the street, you know, goodness, there's a, there's a company that takes a whole picture of the earth by satellite every day. Like, how the hell am I supposed to do anything without, without you know, everyone following me around all the time, right? And um, I imagine that um, whoever it was, and I'm not a historian, so I don't really know, but whoever it was that said, what if, what if we ran plumbing from every single apartment, business, school, maybe even some public toilets underground, 
under our city, all to one location, and then processed it, used chemical treatments, and then turned that into usable drinking water. Like, how laughable would that have been? Would have been just the, the most massive logistical infrastructure problem ever to take a working city, dig up the whole thing, to take already, already constructed buildings and run pipes through all of them. I mean, uh, so, so Oxford, uh, gosh, um, I, there's a building there that's um, so old, they don't have showers because they didn't want to run the plumbing for the head. You have to ladle water over yourself. It's in uh, Merton College. It's quite, quite famous, right? I mean, the, the, the infrastructure, anyway, the infrastructure challenges. Um, it just must have seemed absolutely massive. And so as I'm about to walk through kind of like four broad areas where things could be different, theoretically, based on this technology, and I think it's probably going to hit you like, whoa, that's a lot of code. <laughs> or like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of change. Um, but, but I think that the, the need is sufficiently great. I think that, that, I mean, if you view our lives as just one long process of answering important questions, whether it's where we're going to get food or what causes cancer, like making sure that, that the right people can answer questions without, without you know, data just getting spewed everywhere so that the wrong people can answer their questions, right, is important. And um, yeah, anyway, so I know this is going to sound like there's a certain ridiculousness to, 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 to maybe what some of this will be. But I, I hope that, that you at least see that, that theoretically, like that the basic blocks are there. And, and that really what stands between us and a world that's fundamentally different is, is adoption, maturing of the technology, and, 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 and good engineering. Um, because I think, you know, once, you know, the, Sir Thomas Crapper invented the toilet, right? I do remember that one. Um, um, at, at that point, the, the basics were there, right? And, and what stood between them was, was implementation, adoption, and engineering, right? And, and I, I think that that's, that's where we are. And, and the best part is we have you know, companies like Google that have already, already paved the way with some very, very large rollouts of, of the, the early pieces of this technology, right? Cool, so what are, the, what are the big categories? One I've already talked about, open data for science. Okay, so this one is a really big deal. And the reason it's a really big deal is mostly because everyone gets excited about making AI progress, right? Everyone gets super excited about superhuman ability in X, Y, or Z. Um, when I started my PhD at Oxford, I, I work for, my professor's name is uh, Phil Bluntsom. The first thing he told me when I sat my butt down in his office on my first day as a student, he said, Andrew, everyone's going to want to work on models. But if you look historically, the biggest jumps in progress have happened when we had new big data sets or the ability to process new big data sets. And just to give a few anecdotes, ImageNet, right? ImageNet. GPUs allowing us to process larger data sets. Um, even, even things like AlphaGo. This is synthetically generated infinite data sets. Or, or, or if, I don't know, did you guys, anyone watch the, um, the AlphaStar uh, live stream on YouTube? It talked about how it had trained on like 200 years of, of like, uh, of StarCraft, right? Um, or, or if you look at um, um, Watson, the playing, playing Jeopardy, right? Um, th this was on the heels of, of uh, a new large structured data set based on Wikipedia. Or if you look at, um, um, Gary Kasparov and IBM's Deep Blue. This was on the heels of the largest open data set of chess um, matches haven't been published online, right? There's this, there's this echo where like big new data set, big, big new breakthrough, big new data set, big new breakthrough, right? And what we're talking about here is, is potentially you know, several orders of magnitude more data relatively quickly. And the reason for that is that, that we're not, I'm not saying we're gonna invent a new machine and that machine's gonna collect this and then it's gonna go online. I'm saying there's thousands and thousands of enterprises, millions of smartphones, there's, there's uh, and hundreds of, of governments that all already have this data sitting inside of data warehouses, right? Largely untapped for two reasons. One, legal risk, and two, co commercial viability, right? If I give you a data set, all of a sudden I just doubled the supply, right? What does that do to my billing ability? And there's the legal risk that you might do something bad with it that comes back to hurt me. With this category, I know it's like just one phrase, but, but this is like ImageNet, but for every data task that's already been established, right? This is us, like, I mean, I, I, we're working with a professor at Oxford in a psychology department who wants to study dementia, right? He is, the problem with dementia is, is 
every hospital has like five cases, right? It's not like a very centralized disease. It's not like all the, all the cancer patients go to, you know, one big center and like it's where all the technology is. Like dementia, um, it's, it's, it's sprinkled everywhere. And so the big thing that's blocking him as a dementia researcher is access to data. And so he's investing in private data science platforms. And I, I didn't persuade him to. I, I found him after he was, he was already looking to do that. Um, but but pick, pick any challenge that, that where data is already being collected. And, and this can unlock not larger amounts of data that exists, but larger amounts of data that can be, can be used together. Does that make sense? This is like a thousand startups right here. Whereas in, in, instead of going out and trying to buy as many data sets as you can, which is a really hard and really expensive task, talk to anyone who's in Silicon Valley right now trying to do a data science startup, right? Instead, you go to each individual person that has a data set and you say, hey, let me create a gateway between you and the rest of the world that's gonna keep your data safe and allow people to leverage it, right? That's like repeatable business model. Pick a use case, right? Be, be the radiology network gatekeeper, right? Um, okay, so enough on that one. But like, does it make sense how like, on a, a huge variety of tasks, just the ability to have a, a, a data box silo that you can do data science against is gonna increase the accuracy of a huge variety of models really, really, really quickly. Cool? All right, second one. Oh, that's not right. Single use. Accountability. Um, this one's a little bit tricky. Um, get to the airport and you get your bag checked, right? Everyone's familiar with this process, I see. What happens? Someone's sitting at a monitor and they see all of the objects in your bag so that Occasionally, they can spot objects that are dangerous or illicit, right? There's a lot of extra information leakage by virtue of the fact that they have, that they have to sit and look at thousands of, of all of the objects, you know, basically searching every single person's bag totally and completely, just so that occasionally they can find that one. Answer the, the, the question they actually wanted to answer is, is there anything dangerous in this bag? But in order to answer it, they have to basically acquire access to the whole bag. So let's, let's, let's think about the same approach of, of answering questions using data we can't see. The best example of this in the analog world is a sniffing dog. You familiar with like sniffing dogs? So give your bag a, a whiff at the airport, right? These are actually a really privacy preserving thing because dogs don't speak English or any other language. Um, and so the, the benefit is the dog comes by, nope, everything's fine, moves on. The dog has the ability to only reveal one bit of information without you having to search every single bag, okay? That is what I mean when I say a single use accountability system. It means I am looking at some data stream because I'm holding someone accountable, right? And we wanna make it so that I can only answer the question that I claim to be looking into. So if this is a, a video feed, right, for example, right? Instead of getting access to the raw video feed, and, and the, you know, the millions of bits of information, every single person in the frame of you walking around doing whatever, which I could use for, you know, I, even if I'm a good person, I, I technically could use for, for other purposes. But instead, build a system where I build, say, a machine learning classifier, right, that is an auditable piece of technology that looks for whatever I'm supposed to be looking for, right, and I only see frames, you know, I only open up bags that I actually have to. This does two things. One, it makes all of our accountability systems more privacy preserving, which is great, mitigates any potential um, dual or multi-use, right? Um, and two, it means that some things that were simply too off limits for us to, to properly hold people accountable might be possible. Right? One of the things that was really challenging, um, so we used to do email surveillance, um, uh, digital reasoning, right? And, and it, was, it was basically help investment banks find insider traders, right? Because they want to help enforce the laws. They, you know, they get fined billion dollar fines if, if, if anyone um, uh, causes an infraction. But one of the things that was really difficult about developing these kinds of systems 
was that it's so sensitive, right? We're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of emails at some massive investment bank. There's so much private information in there that say none of our data scientists, ba barely any of them, were able to actually work with the data and try to make it better, right? And, and, and this, this, yeah, this makes it really, really difficult. Anyway, cool, so enough on that. Third one, and this is the one I, I think is just incredibly exciting, end-to-end -end encrypted services. WhatsApp, everyone familiar with WhatsApp? Telegram, any of these? These are messaging apps, right? Where a message is encrypted on your phone and it's sent directly to someone else's phone and only that person's phone can decrypt it, right? Which means that someone can provide a service, you know, messaging, without the service provider seeing any of the information that they're actually providing the service over, right? Very powerful idea. What if, the intuition here is that with a combination of machine learning, encrypted computation, and differential privacy, that we could do the same thing for entire services. So imagine going to the doctor, okay? So you go to the doctor, um, this is really a computation between two different data sets. On the one hand, you have the data set that the doctor has, which is their you know, medical background, their knowledge of, of, of different procedures and diseases and tests and all this kind of stuff. And then you have your data set, which is your symptoms, your, your medical history, um, you know, your recent things that you've eaten, um, your, your genes, your genetic predisposition, your heritage, those kinds of things, right? And you're bringing these two data sets together to compute a function. And that function is what, what, what treatment should you have, if any, okay? And the idea here is that so there's this new, um, this new field called structured transparency. I guess I should probably mention. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure you can call it a new field yet because it's not in the literature, but it's been bouncing around a few different circles. And the, um, and it's, it's uh, F, X, Y. I'm not very good with chalk, sorry. Um, and then this is Z. Okay, so this two different people providing their data together, computing a function and an output. So, um, um, so differential privacy protects the output, encrypted computation, so like MPC, which we talked about earlier, protects the input, right? So it allows them to, to, to compute f of x of y, right, without revealing their inputs. Remember this? So basically, encrypt y, encrypt x, compute the function while it's encrypted. Do, do we remember? Do we remember this? Right? And so there's, there's three processes here, right? There's input privacy, which is MPC. There's logic. And then there's output privacy. And this is what you need to be able to do end-to-end -end encrypted services. Okay, so imagine, imagine um, so there are, there are machine learning models that can now do um, skin cancer prediction, right? So I can take a picture of my, of my arm and send it through a machine learning, machine learning model and it'll predict whether or not I have melanoma on my arm, right? Okay, so in this case, machine learning model, perhaps owned by a hospital or a startup, image of my arm, okay, encrypt both, the logic is done by the machine learning model. The prediction, if it's gonna be published to the output, to the, the rest of the world, you use differential privacy, but in this case, the prediction can come back to me, and only I see the decrypted result, okay? The implication being that the, the, the doctor role facilitated by machine learning can classify whether or not I have cancer, can, pro can provide this service without anyone seeing my medical information. I can go to the doctor and get a prognosis without ever revealing my medical records to anyone, including the doctor, right? Does that make sense? And if you believe, if you believe that sort of the services that are repeatable that we do for millions and millions of people, right, can create a training data set that we can then train a classifier to do, then we should be able to upgrade it to be end-to-end -end encrypted. Does that make sense? So again, it's kind of 
It's kind of big. It assumes that, that AI is smart enough to do it. There's lots of questions around quality and like quality assurance and all these kinds of things um, that have to be addressed. Um, there's very likely to be different institutions that we need. Um, but I hope that at least these three sort of big categories, this is by no means comprehensive, but I hope that at least these three big categories will be sort of sufficient um, for helping sort of lay the groundwork for how sort of each person could be empowered with sole control over the only copies of their information while still receiving the same goods and services that they've become accustomed to. Cool? Thanks, questions, let's do it. First, please give Andrew a big hand. <laughs> Andrew, it was fascinating, really, oh. really fascinating. Amazing, amazing set of ideas, and hopefully this can really get rid of the sewage of, of data. <laughs> um, so on the on the on this vision of end-to-end um, uh, -end encrypted services, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, the algorithm would also run on two or more services, mm -hmm. and the skin image would go to them, mm -hmm. and then you would get uh, the, the, the diagnosis. But the diagnosis itself is not private, though, because that's... The output of that is, is being revealed to the service provider. Um, so it could it could optionally be, be revealed to the service provider. So in this case, oh yeah, something I didn't I didn't say for secure MPC for encrypted computation, uh, except for some with with some exceptions. But for secure MPC, when you perform computation between two encrypted numbers, the result is encrypted between the same shareholders. If that makes sense, meaning that by default, Z is still encrypted with the same keys as X and Y. And then it's, it's up to the key holders to decide who they want to decrypt it for. So they could decrypt it for the general public, in which case they should apply differential privacy. They could decrypt it um, for the, the input owner, in which case um, the input owner is not going to hurt anybody else by him knowing whether or not, whether he has a certain di uh, diagnosis. Um, or it could be decrypted for the, the, um, the model owner, uh, perhaps to allow them to do more training or, or some other arbitrary use case, right? But so, so it can be, but not 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 as a strict requirement. Uh, just to be sure, I mean, if if Z is being computed by say two parties mm -hmm. to send Z back to back to Y in this case, mm -hmm. um, the machine knows what Z is. So in that sense, even if you encrypt Z with the with the with the key of Y, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's no way to protect the output itself. Um, hmm, I haven't I haven't described this correctly. So. Um, when we perform the encrypted computation, we split this into shares. So we'll say, you know, y, y1 and y2, right? y2 goes up here, right? And then this populates, what actually happens is this creates z1 and z2 at the end, right? Which is still, which is still owned by, you know, person y. So we'll say this is uh, Alice, and this is Bob, right? So we have Bob's share and Alice's share. What gets populated is, is shares of Z. So if, Alice, or if Bob sends his share of Z down to Alice, only Alice can decrypt the result. So does that make, does that make more sense? Okay, cool. So even the answer is... is even the is answer is, is protected, yep. And you would only need to use differential privacy in the case that you're planning to decrypt the result for some, some unknown audience to be able to see. Uh, <clears throat> some models are biased based on real data mm -hmm. biases, uh, and society tries to make unbiased models uh, like on gender, race, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it work with privacy, especially when everything is encrypted? So how can you like, unbiased models when you do not see biases in the data and, and so on? That's a great question. Um, so the the first the first gimme for that um, is that people don't ever really de-bias a model by physically reading the weights, right? So, so the fact that the weights are, are encrypted doesn't necessarily help or hurt you. Um, um, so re really what it's about is just making sure that you provision enough of your privacy budget to allow you to do the introspection that you need to be able to measure and adjust for, for bias. So I think that's, that's uh, is, that, is that sufficient? Does that, does that make sense? Cool, awesome. Great question there. Um, how far away do you think we are from organizations like the FDA requiring differential privacy to be used in regulating uh, medical algorithms? <laughs> uh, um, so I think the best answer I can give to that, so one, I don't know. Um, and even laws in the UK 
regarding privacy like GDPR are not prescriptive about things like, like differential privacy. Um, but I think the best and most relevant data point I have for you on that is that the US census this year is going to be protecting the census data, the 2020 census data using differential privacy. Um, and this, like some of the leading work on actually applying differential privacy in the world is going on at the US census. Um, and I'm sure they'd be interested uh, in more helpers if anyone was interested in joining them. Uh, so I guess her question was kind of my one of my questions, mm -hmm. uh, but it was more just like how much buy-in are you getting in terms of adoption um, for open mind or mm -hmm. any of like, do you have like any oh. hospitals that are like participating or? Um, yeah, so actually there's a few things I probably should have mentioned. Um, so, uh, the, so OpenMind is about two and a half years old. Um, in the very beginning, we had very little buy-in because um, it was just so early that it was kind of like, who cares about privacy? No one's ever gonna sort of really, really care about that. Post GDPR, total, total change, right? Um, everyone's scrambling to, to protect the data. But the, the truth is, it's not just privacy, it's also commercial usability. Right now, if you're selling data, every time you, you sell it, you lower the price because you increase the supply and you increase the number of people that are, that are also selling it. So I think that there's, there's people also waking up to kind of the commercial, commercial reasons for protecting their own data sets and protecting kind of the, the unique statistical signal that they, that they have. Um, uh, it's also worth mentioning, so the PyTorch team um, recently sponsored uh, $250,000 in open source grants to fund people to work on uh, our PySafe library, um, which is really good. Um, and we're hoping to announce sort of more grants of similar size later in the year. So if, if you guys like working on open source code and, and uh, like to get paid to do so, um, um, to, that, to that extent, that's sort of uh, a, a big vote and, and buy-in. Um, as far as our community is concerned. So um, this year is when I, I hope to see kind of the first pilots rolling out. I, um, there are some that are sort of in the works, but I, I, I can't, they're not public yet. But um, okay. yeah, so I think basically this is the year for like pilots. Okay. I think it's, that's about as far as we are. Um, um, and then I have another question that's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a little mm -hmm. more technical weeds. Cool. Um, so when you do the, separate when you're doing the encryption where you separate everything into each of the mm -hmm. different owners mm -hmm. um how does that work for nonlinear functions because i would just you need it's a lot that linearity here. to like add it back and for it to totally maintain the totally um so the nonlinear functions are the most complicated or the most uh performance intensive uh and to the extent they, they, they you get the biggest performance hit when you have to do them okay. um the for deep learning specifically, um, there's kind of two trends. Um, so one line of research is around using polynomial approximations. Um, uh, and then the other line is around uh, doing sort of discrete comparison functions, so which is good for ReLUs and it's good for lopping off the ends of your polynomials so that your unstable tails can be flat. Um, and I would say that's about um, that and then like the science of kind of like trying to relax your security assumptions strategically here and there to get more performance is about where we're at. Um, but as far as, the, the one thing is, it's worth mentioning though is that there's, there, are multi, there are kind of, what I described was uh, securing PC sort of on, on you know, integers uh, and, 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 and uh, fixed, fixed precision numbers. You can also do it on, on sort of binary, but uh, in that sense it's, you get a huge performance if you're doing it with binary, but you, you also get the ability to do things sort of more classically with computing. Uh, encrypted computation is sort of like doing computing in the 70s. Like you get, you get a lot of the same kind of, kind of constraints. Um, Thank you very much for your talk, Andrew. Yeah. I'm wondering about your objective to ultimately allow every individual to assign a privacy budget, mm -hmm. uh, you think, um, you also mentioned, you mentioned that uh, it would take a lot of work to mm -hmm. provide the infrastructure for that to be possible. Uh, so do you have an idea for what kind of infrastructure is necessary? And also, uh, when people are reluctant, and maybe even uh, perhaps lazy, mm -hmm. and you know, they don't really care, and they don't want their data to be protected. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess it takes some training, but uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on building that infrastructure? Um, 
I think it's going to come in waves. It's the kind of thing where like people don't usually invest money and time and resources into things that aren't like a straight shot to value. Um, so I think there's probably going to be multiple individual discrete jumps. Um, the first one is going to be just enterprise adoption. Enterprises are the ones that already have all the data, so they're the ones who are most natural to start, start adopting privacy-preserving technologies. And I think that that adoption is going to be driven primarily by commercial reasons, for commercial reasons, meaning my data is inherently more valuable if I can keep it scarce while allowing people to answer questions with it, if that makes sense. Um, so it's more profitable for me to not send copies of my data to people if I can actually have them bring their question answering mechanisms to me and just get their questions answered. Does that, does that make sense? Um, that's not a privacy narrative, but I think that that narrative is going to mature privacy technology quite quickly. Um, um, uh, post sort of enterprise adoption, um, I think that um, that's when that's end encrypted services are still really hard at this point. And the reason for that is that they require lots of compute and lots of network overhead, which means that um, you probably want to have something in, in, in the cloud, right? So some sort of machine that you can own and control in the cloud or have the internet get a lot faster. Um, so there's the, but there's this, there's this question of like, how, how do we actually get to a world where, um, where each individual person sort of knows or has notional control over their, their own personal privacy budget, right? And, um, Let's just say you had perfect enterprise adoption, right? And everyone's tracking their stuff with difference for privacy. The piece that you're actually missing here is, is just some sort of communication between all the different enterprises that are, are joining up and making, it's just an accounting mechanism, right? It's, 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 it's a lot like, it's not like the IRS, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's just someone to be there to make sure that, that you're not double spending in, in, in different, different places. Right, the, the, your, your epsilon budget that's over here versus over here versus over here is, 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 is all coming from the same place. It's not totally clear who this actor would be. Right? It, um, maybe, maybe there's an app that just does it for you. Maybe there has to be an institution around it. Maybe, maybe it won't happen at all. Maybe it'll just be decentralized, but you know, whatever. Um, another option is that um, there'll actually be data banks. Right? So there's been uh, some literature in the last couple of years around saying, okay, maybe, maybe institutions that um, they currently handle you know your, your money might also be the, the bank where all of your information lives right and and that becomes the gateway to to your data or something like that so there's there's different things that are because that, that would obviously make the accounting much easier um, um, and also that would give you kind of that cloud to cloud sort of performance in, increase so so um, it does, it's I think it's clear we wouldn't go to data banks or, or, or these kinds of centralized accounting registries directly because you kind of have to have the initial adoption first um, but if I had to guess it's something it's something like that right we, we won't see that for a while um, and um, it's not even clear what what that would look like um, but uh, but I think it is, it is possible we just have to get through sort of non-trivial adoption first Thank you. yeah. So it's kind of a hazy, but um, it's predicting the future. So I guess that's how that goes. I was wondering. Excuse me. I was just wondering if you can comment briefly on what you think is the biggest mistake being made with respect to recommendation systems transparency, hmm. and what and if you can comment briefly on what you think might be the most uh, or the best solution. So I don't know if this is a mistake. I would say the biggest opportunity for recommendation systems is that they have the potential to be more holistic. So. Um, for example, if you recommended a movie to me based on um, whether or not it's most likely to keep me engaged, right? keep me watching movies, it's not really a holistic recommendation. It's not really saying, hey, you should do this because it's going to make your life more fulfilling, more satisfied, whatever. It's just going to glue me to my television more. right? Um, so I think the, best, the biggest opportunity, and particularly with privacy-preserving machine learning, is that if a recommender system could have the ability to access private data without actually seeing it, right? And answer the question, you know, how do I give the best recommendation so that this person gets a good night's sleep or has more meaningful friendships or whatever? Like these, these, these attributes that are actually particularly sensitive, but there are things that we actually want to optimize for that we could have vastly more beneficial recommendation systems than we do now, just by virtue of having better infrastructure for dealing with private data. So I think actually, what, like, as far as like, um, um, the biggest limitation in recommender systems right now is just that they don't have access to enough information to have good targets. Does that, does that make sense? Like we, 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 we would like for them to have better targets, but in order to do that, they have to have access to information about those targets. Um, and I think that's what sort of privacy-preserving technologies could bring to bear on recommendation systems. But, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great question, by the way. One more time, please give Andrew a big hand. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. thanks for having me. <laughs>